Hi, good evening, guys. How are we doing today? I'm good. Excellent. Oh, great. Very good news. Sounds good. Sounds good that everybody in Tide and Nova went. Okay, I hope you all enjoying the weather and you all had a productive week. Um, the homework grades will come out um, this evening, I guess, by the end of class. Everybody should have received their homework grade for the ones that um, completed it last week. Um, we want to, Renita, I, I know last week you couldn't speak. Are you, are you able to speak this week so we can ensure that you on the same page as everybody else? Is Renita there? I, I get it. I get it, Ms. Bullard. Oh, so you okay with the homework? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Okay, good. Good. Okay, guys, then we'll jump right into our newspaper clippings and our civic organization. Remember, this is now week five, and it was like a blink of the eye, and, and we reached to blink up to week five, and so we'll blink again, and we'll be at week 10, and I'm certain that we don't have until week 10 to get all of our points. I can't stress enough how important the points are so that we do not have to do a retake at it now increased from $150 to $200. Um, and the test is normally a little bit harder because it's it, this first exam will be tailored directly to what we discuss in class. The second exam won't be. So it's a little bit difficult the second time. So this is very achievable. So try to do your best to, to first go around. OK, I see a few um, hands raised. Um, Nicolette, Renita, Bria, and Shalisa. Okay, let's start with Nicolette. Um, go ahead. You want to share with us a newspaper clipping or your civic organization? Um, good evening. Um, civic organization, Ms. Butler. Okay, go ahead. Um, on Tuesday evening, um, I attended Toastmasters Club meeting via Zoom. Um, the chairman of the meeting was Andrew Aubrey. Um, the topic was reflection school days. Um, at the beginning of the meeting, they played um, God Serve the Queen in honor of the Queen. Um, 
uh, word of the day was titivate. It means make minor enhancements or make oneself look smarter. And the table topics, during the table talk it, topics, um, um, asked like questions like, what was your uh, most valuable memory of primary school days? Were you considered the teacher's pet? Um, did you work like, say at a fast food restaurant or um, during your college days? And how did you feel about that? Then they had two speakers. The first speaker was TM Donovan Lynch. He spoke on time management in college and the importance of it. And then the second speaker, um, which who was TM Dom, 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 Domica Davis, sorry. And she spoke on the different styles of communication, being direct, initiating, analytical, and supportive. And then they did evaluations. And then they had the educational tip for the day, um, which was the Toastmasters values. Um, the acronym is RISE, Respect, Integrity, Service, and Excellence. Um, and she also added that true leaders strive for excellence. They lead with integrity and should always be willing to serve. Okay, and so what was your uh, takeaway from, from the meeting? What, what stood with you? Were you inspired? Did you find it beneficial? Um, I actually enjoyed this meeting more than the last one from the last class. Um, okay. The chairman, you know, he made it really like um, enjoyable. Um, he, we asked, um, all of the guests were able to introduce themselves and then he asked what we thought about um, the meeting. Um, okay, and so in terms of, did, did, did you work as Ms. Bullet started off at McDonald's and I'm very, very proud when McDonald's was in Navy Line Road, you know, I used to be there mopping the floor. And a few years ago, um, I read that most CEOs and top executives would have worked in McDonald's in their earlier years. And so they labeled um, McDonald's as one of the best training grounds for entry level staff. So I was proud. So I don't know, Any, anybody else? Did you have to work, Nicolette, or, 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 or you, you, you was privileged? Um, you were privileged I, no, I worked, but just during breaks, like summer breaks and stuff. Yeah, yeah, so that's when I, I, I started um, at summer break, and then um, I think when I turned 16, they was like, they could make me a cashier, and so I was all excited. Now I go in from Muffin to Florida, a cashier. So I stayed mm. here, and I... I attribute most of my um, career success to that good sound training ground. Miss Bullard, when, when was this? What year this was? Jesus, you all were sent born, Latoya. Um, now you know that. <laughs> this was I, I asked because my mom actually, she spent 40 years there. 40? Okay. 40? Yeah, and just your yeah, same story. She actually, that was her story as well. Okay, she, yes. left, she left as training manager for all of the restaurants and she just oh. left and right right after COVID. That was yeah, it. my it is it, you know, she she would know my cousin Katrice Pratt here because my, yeah. my cousin was there and spent 40 years there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I would have been there in 1990. He was born in 1990. Yes, mom. Long time. Okay. Yeah. So in 1990, <laughs> I, I yeah, 89, 90, I, I would have been there. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. I actually was there as well too, but um, it was just for a short time. Okay, yeah, but, so yeah. so good, good, good training ground. It is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good, very good. Um, Nicolette, thank, thank you so much for sharing. And I am glad that you found this one a little bit more exciting. And then hopefully, if only for the sake of networking, you, you, you go back <laughs> and, um, if you don't want to join, at least I'd say once per quarter, making a parents and you know, 
rubbed shoulders with the movers and shakers. Okay, so so very good. Um, Shalisa? Sorry, Michelle, like you were saying something else? No, that's it. No. Oh, okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm good yourself? I'm good. Thank you. Okay. You wanted to share or you were just saying good afternoon? No, just saying good afternoon. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. So can we hear from Shalisa, then Bria, then Renita, then Avery, Geraldo, and then Shamara? Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this Tuesday, you know, Tuesday passed, I attended the NASA conference, well, the Financial Services Bootcamp, and I must say it was awesome, even though we only had two sessions, but it was very, I, I call it a networking event because there were different um, organizations and different companies there, so we were able to network, talk to a few, I'll say, executives and basically get to know one another. Um, but Miss, well, Dr. McCartney, Tanya McCartney, she welcomed us. Um, she's the CEO and executive director of the BFSB. So she made us feel welcome. It was really, it was really good, you know, but it was more so leaned onto the DARE Act and the digital assets business in the Bahamas. We had three presenters, um, I think Dr. Jillian Baffel, Dr. Brian, and Mr. Marvin Colby. Um, Kelly Ingram was the, she was the moderator. Oh, yeah. She's also a director. Um, and that was, that's a good, but with, in, well, with compliance, that's something we should all get into as digital assets is now becoming a thing of the now. <laughs> So the regulatory framework and everything that comes with compliance goes with that, to my knowledge, well, to my understanding, for me. Um, that's just my take on it. Okay, and do we know who regulates that industry in the Bahamas? The Securities Commission? Yes, and, and this is the FinTech hub that all of you were supposed to be following from uh, last semester, correct? Yes, ma'am. Right. Okay. Very, very good. Very good. Yeah. So okay. it was really, it was really good for me as a for a networking event, I should say. Okay. Okay. Very good. And like, like I say, they have um, a whole media department um, online, and so if any of you missed it and they you want to go back and um, you know, see some recordings or handouts or anything. Um, visit the Securities Commission um, site, the FinTech Hub, and, and see what information you can get. Or you can visit Bahamas Financial Services Board website, which you should also be subscribed to, and, and try and get some information from Dr. McCartney. So excellent. Very good, Shalisa. Um, and thank you for sharing. OK, um, I think, Lenique, you wanted to say something? Uh, no, ma'am. Oh, okay. All right. Um, Bria? Good afternoon, everyone. I also afternoon. attended the, oh, the Toastmasters class. I'm in meeting on Tuesday. Um, Nicolette gave a quite in-depth run through of what they went through, but it was very interesting to me. I like how the chairman, the chairperson, Mr. Albury, had everyone engaged. He, tell, he told some jokes. Um, he let us introduce ourselves. We shared our contact information. Okay, um, excellent. Yes, my favorite speaker was Tamika, um, TM Davis, Tamika Davis. She talked about the different styles of communication. I feel like these styles, um, all of these styles should be used in um, the workplace and when you're dealing with employees and your coworkers. Um, I also liked how they evaluated the speakers afterwards. And so, so give us some of the, what, what was some of the styles? The, okay, the different styles was, um, there are four different styles. One was to wreck the positive and that was it's more results, but it could be very demanding. Um, the next style was supportive. This is one who listens, um, but the negative and that could be they're indecisive. Um, the next style would be analytical. 
someone who is precise, but they might be a perfectionist. And the next style was initiating someone as, who is in social, who is sociable, enthusiastic, but they might not be so attentive. So she gave the pros and the positives of these four working styles. The pros and the cons. Yes, sorry, the pros yeah. and the cons of these four working styles. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah and, yeah, and you're correct that all of them should be used because with, with the good, there's always the bad, mm -hmm. you know? And so you just have to try to be as balanced as, as human you could be. Exactly. As simple as that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so very good, Bria. I, I'm glad that you also found it beneficial. And again, when we not only we go there to network, but we go there to learn. So yes. it's, a, it's a form of being you know mentored whilst you're there because you, you learn so much yeah. okay so 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 very good very good um okay. Renita yes I didn't look I already did my civic but I read a newspaper article today on the court overturning the purchase of two exuma keys by some tourists apparently okay. some lawyer Mr. Allen he is the son of a former minister of finance he, I guess, was the lawyer that brokered this transaction, but the court overturned it, say that he didn't have, they didn't have the proper paperwork. The paperwork that they did have was fraudulent. So I don't know what's going to happen with the funds that they already spent on the keys, but the court, of, the court ruled that they didn't have no right to sell the keys, so they don't have no ownership of it. Okay, so wait, so did they, did, who owned these keys? The Bahamas government, I guess, apparently. I guess so, because it said they abused the Quieting Titles Act. Oh, okay, so okay. Yeah, because Jim you can't, can't number key, some minutes no more. Yeah, you can't buy a key. You have to um, apply and lease it for 99 years. And then- or whatever they, they did do, they thought the documents were, in, um, the documents were fraudulent. Yeah, okay. Okay. The court ruled that the, the, the documents weren't um weren't for, weren't um correct, so oh, okay. they lost out on that. But the thing about it is, they sold it for less than the keys were even worth. Anyway, six point two. Because one of them because, is worth twenty million. Probably because they knew it was fraudulent, so they dropped the price to make it attractive, right? Eh? Right, and and they tried to bribe somebody to testify on their behalf and tell them they could buy him a boat and a house if he gave evidence in their favor. Mm -hmm. oh, oh boy wow. yeah oh, wow. this is the, just like the episode of law order yeah i think they were saying that they was actually they were actually what what was that latoya latoya you're my corner oh she, okay we we're talking to us latoya no Ready, okay. sorry sorry nixon him and his siblings were supposed to own those keys. And he alone, he went and he did that um, transaction. And he was very, very secretive about it, like Gia said. Oh, OK, what's the first name? Who, who next? Nixon. Oh, Nixon. I look at it right now. You're right. It's the children yes. of the late King Richard Nixon. Right, right. And he and this Samuel Burroughs, um, falsified all the information and did you read also that the um attorney he was actually representing him and the purchasers from the from the u.s as well so yeah he, he he was doing a lot of he did the most underhand work they should take him they should right. take him from the bar exactly exactly that was that that was really interesting okay that wow was, so, it sounds like a movie, movie for real yeah, that was my civic. I put my hands up, but I say, I'm gonna read it. I'm gonna do it now. But that was my newspaper yeah. thing, too. <laughs> oh, that's okay. that's not like some shit out of law and order. I'm telling right. you, I'm telling right. you. Where's the Ashman? Who the Ashman? What's your take on this? Because I know you're familiar with these properties and uh, the ministry and stuff like that. You any comment from you? Okay. Any comment from you? First of all, my auntie phone <laughs> on Monday, y'all. Okay, oh, so, okay. Have our um, condolences. Have our condolences. Yes. Yeah. Queen Lizzie, I pronounce on Monday, <laughs> but <laughs> now I I don't feel as if it's right for our government to even be thinking of selling our keys on our island to any foreigner. That's my personal take. 
But again, no, the asthma, they, they don't, don't sell. They lease for 99. Yes, they don't sell. That's selling. That's selling because who will be around for the next 90, no, for, for 99 no. years? Nobody. Yes, Nobody. Look at the board and free board. Don't say that. Look at the board and free board. Oh, that right, right. Okay. Yeah, you're right. You're right. What, what was that? No, she was like saying, look at what happened to the port in Freeport. Right. So only the yeah. Freeport suffers and the port, the, the owners of the ports are billionaires. So yeah, that's what she means. That's crazy. You don't, you yeah. don't do that. You know how much people go to these, to these kids and, and our our realtors taking them to look at keys on a boat. Who's do that? That's how that's how you think up. Hey, 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 hey. Okay, but the asthma, let me, let me tell you that somebody recently, um, when we were talking about um, Crown Land and on the island, somebody actually approached me and they said, well, Ms. Bullet, I'm not even going to apply for just a piece of Crown Land anymore. I'm going to apply for one of these islands because uh, the Exoma Keys have so many. And, and, and they was in the process and they said, I might need you to help me, but I, they, you know, they haven't called me back yet. So yeah, uh, look into that. Um, you could apply for, for a, an entire island. You don't have to just get a piece of crown land. So so I know yeah, you, you can you can develop that with me, Miss Buller, Miss Buller, Miss Buller. Of course. You get it started. Get it started. This is my go-to place you get it started. Go to place you get, you, all right, you all right. Let's do this. Yeah, we have 20 what people in this place. Hey, we have 20 persons in our class, in this class to help us invest. So, you know. Get it started. I I dead serious. If if the yeah. foreigners can do it, why can't? Oh, I serious Yeah, because so I can need me an island. Because yeah. when I get tired of these people, I can need to just go and say I own an island. There, oh. there you go. There you go. And then we can approach our work X to do our crowdfunding. Right. Correct. 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 Okay. I serious. I I dead serious. Okay. Okay, guys. So very very good. Um. And, and keep up the up the breast um of what's happening in the country because like I said, if these foreigners could come in and, and apply for an island, we could apply for our island as well. Okay. So 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 look at it think globally and and they come here and they make these private islands and um they charge if you go online, they charge like twenty five thousand and thirty thousand a night. And these islands are they booked out for like two years. Like when um, I think whoever wins the the um, basketball, what what do you call it? When um, the basketball um, championship, um, right after I don't know if it's just LeBron's team, but right after they used to always go to Guanaki in um, in uh, off of Abaco, and apparently some one of them own houses in the. Rest of them used to just rent out houses on Guanaki, you know, as a relaxation and fishing and what have you. And I would go after the championships and apparently that's a as a common practice. So so you, you would be surprised. You go online and those they're they're ridiculous prices and they bucked out for years. So th think about it. Okay, very very good. Um Avery. Hi, good afternoon. I did um, read a newspaper article, uh, actually a few, but one that stood out was the Gladstone Road project. It was in the, the road work project in the Tribune. And they were just mentioning how some businesses fear that that, pro that project will affect their business. Um, I think they're widening the road and um, making it a dual carriageway. And I think it's a $29 million contract. And it's going to stretch over two years. So, um, I know. Who would business on God soon would will be affected with the car place or or the propane businesses? Or, okay. The, but the, do people do people go are, and pick up gas anymore, or don't they just deliver? People still go pick gas up. Yes, that's what I thought. I mean, I can't lift no, I can't disconnect no tank and lift it. So. Like who doing this many? Because I sure women yeah, ain't disconnecting no time. I do it a few times instead of waiting around. You so, disconnect yours. Who's lift that for you, Latoya? 
Well, I just make my children live it or my husband. But I, oh. when I try it, if I ask someone is, to do is it, that safe? And they don't do it. You have to know what you're doing. Oh, okay, okay. You I have to that. know what you're doing because it's just making sure that it's off. And then once you bring it back before you, well, when you turn it on, make sure it's connected properly. When you turn it on, you have to check to see if any leaking, any leaks or whatever. So you just have to know what you're doing. Okay, but, but my, you know my gas people have been very good. I mean, I used to go to Moss Gas, but I had to have, give him some words. And so I switched right over to Island Gas. And <laughs> if I call them in the morning, by the end of the day, they just yeah. be there. I never had a problem even during the pandemic. They came like within the day. Uh, no, no, you always have a problem when you call on the phone and order it? No, no I know what for me. I could just all automatically just call call the person and they just come and deliver my gas. Sometimes it doesn't take too long. Yeah, sometimes it'll take too long, but I can never take the gas. Not sure. I wait. I wait for delivery. I ain't got time to be the stuff to lift up my gas. I ain't never disconnected. I do afraid. I I can't even lift it. I wait until I'm waiting till the people them come there. Yeah. And come and disconnect it themselves. And hey, come measure the the, the 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 lighter or the burn on the stove. Make sure that running good. And that's right. me. Right. Yeah. Well, it'll be me disconnecting. Oh, and they bring the you different. Fuck. They don't necessarily have to take the tank. They bring the yeah. truck and fill it right up. Okay. They pull it up. Yeah. They don't take the tank. Thank you. That's what I know. They bring the hose. They bring the truck in the front of your yard. They bring the hose and they get the hose straight to your tank. Yeah. Right, and, and I have a gas dryer too, and I be I be distraught when I have to go when I empty, and I have to go to super wash. I be distraught. So <laughs> I, I speak, it seems like every time I wash, it ain't that bad. Off the gas gone. Invest in a smaller tank. Yeah, she said you need to get a bigger tank. You need to get one. Get one you get gas dry. You need one of them four hundred pound tank. You can't yeah, get on a small 100 pound tank. No, I have two. I have right. two tanks. I have 200 pound tanks. I, I can't afford the 400 pound one. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ms. Valencia, <laughs> I, I, I can't afford it. Yeah, so I have two small tanks. But boy, one time, I, um, or a couple of times, the two was empty, you know, because I just like, oh, thank God, I have two tanks. I can just let somebody screw on the next one. And then, oof, I let that em empty and back to superwash. I just want to crap. But anyway, Ms. Bullet, you need to when the first tank is empty, call the gas well, people. I know. Yeah. So I you know. Have to right? continue. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. I can do that. Yeah. But okay, every so, I mean, I guess industrial businesses, they already, you know, yeah. really, I mean, really the gas people think that the widening the roading would be better for them. But you remember, remember they had that same. Something like Tony Darling Highway, if you want to exactly. get to business, you have to go way around and you know they're gonna to go to their competitor instead of them. So right, okay, okay. But that road is I mean, I used to see the traffic going not, and coming. It's, but not all it's, businesses are complaining. I think Pat Race Batting, so he looks forward to it. He was quoted that he was thrilled about it. Yeah, yeah. Some some, some yeah, some some and so think, so what about Wong? Did Wong say anything? Because they're also there all so the, the yeah, container ports are there as well. Yeah, they quoted, um, I think Chico Wong is the, the manager. They quoted him, he said, just as a sense of, um, what he said, a sense of it's going to be a double in or not. He just is concerned if they make it into a super highway person so to go round and round to get to him. So that's another thing. But mm -hmm. the industry works at their widening it and make it more safe. I mean, so I guess that's the pros about it. Um, Street, more street lighting, road marks, sidewalks, bicycle trail. I don't know. So, but they need to do something with Kamaika Road. I mean, my God, Kamaika Road is like, is it the voice road in the Bahamas or is just Miss Bullitty Field? So, because I think that's where the, the, the bottleneck of traffic coming from Kamaika. Kamaika yeah, needs to be widened. If they have the space, I don't know. Yeah, I think Kamaika is the problem that causes all the traffic. Because yeah. people either go and come you know, you don't think so? The widening of the road, I don't think it's a problem because I live in the area and I have to go. Um, um, look at me. I'll take it off, baby. Um, um, where, where, where the, where the, Samila Butler. I go Samila Butler every morning, literally every morning. 
And I believe that's going to be a nuisance when they start with the roadworks on Gladstone. I can have to leave home 6.30 to reach my turn school, I Chippenham, for 7.45. Because that's crazy. And um, why do they, I don't think that they need to make that a dual carriageway. I think that they need to make um, turning lanes. That's the issue on, on Gladstone Road because oh, nobody will let stretch. nobody out to turn and then they block people. That's my issue with Gladstone Road. Yes, they could widen it, but to make that dual carriage to me, it's not going to make no sense. You're still going to have that traffic. You have the school that's there, um, Aquinas. That, that's always a problem. And, and when I was working cable, where, I mean, my um, co-workers that work Cable Beach, they live um Coral Harbor and they ain't going Coral Harbor Way. They going Ron. They ain't even going Gladstone Road. They going Tony William. I mean, not Tony William, um, Samila Butler to come up Carroll Road to get to Cable Beach. That's right. just how bad Gladstone is. So they can widen it. Don't make it no dual carriage. Just put turning lanes to where these businesses are. That is that's literally the issue. Not not the fact that it it, it it's it don't have enough space. It's the fact that you just need turning lanes. That's the only. Yeah, I agree with that. I'm sure but, that the, the road is properly turning lanes to go where though. Yeah, that's that what they road. said. They put an extra lights. They put an extra light. But listen, would y'all even think about this traffic now that school open? I mean. Every if when I sit in this traffic in the mornings, I'm just like this makes no sense. Yeah. But you know, Miss Billard, uh, and and I was saying, I think that was the Yasmin who just was on, the the police officer that is actually at the at the roundabout at Harold Road and uh, Mile Butler Highway. Listen, I stopped going that way because it's as if he's only trying to get the congestion out of. The Kamaika Road area, the Kamaika Road area, right? I say because I say that's, that's, right. I say it's it's right. say that's where it, it come from. Yeah, I say no. I say his wife on that side. He got a no. His wife is not on that side because I know him and on his wife. I want rather in the morning. I reach that intersection. No, when I used to work the life of key, I used to say, oh, "Now you know this man wife have to be in this traffic." Man, listen. That's the only side he's let out. I don't know what's going on with him, but if you're on Howard Road side, you would listen. I've timed it. Sometimes you'll reach there by Burger King, or maybe even before Burger King closer down to where the gas station is by where Ron says and sometimes it'll take you 20 minutes 25 minutes in yeah. order for you to get right to that roundabout and he's right. just focusing on my my yeah. butler I just want the toy how you was dry never mind that's, never why, mind. I said, that's why I said that's why I said I don't go that way anymore usually this is me and my husband was sharing he was sitting in that traffic I would be dead mad because I could be late he works on the road so now that I'm driving, I go around to avoid him. You understand? So it's only those same two Delfo that's actually congested. Harold Road heading west and Myla Butler, and he only focusing on Myla Butler. What happens if them other police officers come there? What makes no sense? The two motorbikes who ride around and around and about. So. Yep. But like I say, since school I don't know. It has been ridiculous. Yes, but so why? Why? And not only not the, not business, the traffic, the cost of school uniform. I mean, really? Yeah. Was online school that bad? Everybody know. electricity going back up. I mean, it's crazy. I know you all have younger children. And, mm -hmm. and yes, primary school children perhaps need to be in school. But I do not agree. I don't think that high school kids who can sign on to the computer and, and the internet is their life. Make we, them responsible. We, wow. Yeah, make them responsible. And they, I guess, check their report yeah. cards and, and exactly. keep some of these children home, especially you have the government schools overcrowded. This, this, the mean? traffic alone makes no sense. But, but didn't, didn't we have a, a more than 50% drop of student attendance exactly. since exactly. COVID? Since COVID. Yeah, a but lot that's, of a, that's, a parent, that's a parent issue. My child can't live in my house if they drop out of school. Like that, that ain't allowed. I agree. And then that's another thing too, though. Screaming. That ain't allowed. Where you live? A lot of children, live? children to do whatever they feel like doing. So right. I feel like they allow them to go to school just so that they can have some place to be in the day, and they're still no. not serving any purpose anyway. Uh, uh, there you go. No, it, it, I say 
as long as you live in my house, you follow my rules, okay? And I always say, but, I say love is a two-way street. If exactly. I go to work and I pay the bills, you got to do something. You have to have grades. You have to be respectful, you know? So exactly. you have to teach us a give and a take. That's right. But but, but I, I cannot but, see a child dropping out of school under my roof. I guess I, it, it just don't work that way for me. It don't. Well, I, mean, I do agree that it's the parent, but don't they have now, um, the government schools, they have like... I know C.R. Walker and C.B. Bethel, that's the one on um, East Street East South. Street, yeah. I think they, they are the business school. So if you're interested in doing business when you grow up, that's where you go. And I think Arm Bailey and um, Doris, it's like the technical school, like the hands-on school if you want to do I be a beautician, if you want to trade across the board. The trade, yes, the yeah. trade work. I, I think I, they, they made a change in the syllabus and that I think is going to be a game changer. And I feel as if we're going to attract more students that way. Why? You ain't just have every government school doing the same thing. We have two schools focusing and these are on opposite sides of the island. But they you know, focusing on. Mm -hmm. But you know, I feel as though it should be straight across the board for all of the schools. Because remember now, these are feeder schools that actually can, um, deals with their community children. Yeah, I understand, but we don't have the teachers to supply it. Teachers. Yeah, that's true too, that's true we too. We don't have the teachers to supply it. So we put those commerce, economics, accounts teachers, we put them teachers at specific, mm -hmm. specific ends mm -hmm. and they're centralized to where half of the island go here, the next half go there. Yes, it's a commute, but it's gonna work out. I At least I, I have faith that it's gonna work out. Then we have those who want to do nails, who want to do hair, and they're really good because we have students. I don't know if y'all know Robert in the group. Yeah. Robert um, yeah. have one little hair salon about in the back of his shop on upstairs, mm -hmm. and all of them are students. They work after school. They work on weekends, and they braid hair. We have a couple who are doing nails, who um, the community pay for their classes. Oh, for whoever they can get to them. Yeah. And, like, I, and, never, and they working all through the pandemic, they was making money because my hair was getting braided. <laughs> okay. that, that's I very good. good. We yeah. need a proper bus, bus system in this country. Yeah. And that yes. eliminates a lot yes. of the... As if but students... it's what amazing me, Ms. Knowles, that Atlantis can have a proper bus schedule that pick up points, you you get to this point, we get you, but you have to go, why can't trans, Ministry of Transport and the bus people get the same oh, type of system? And place. The school, that's and, right. But they oh, do have, yeah. bus, some, some do have a bus system. They do have the bus systems for the some, school. It just ain't working. It just ain't no, working. It, it, it's, it's too much children. Then increase, increase the number of buses. That's all. We, we, spend, we spend so much money on trivial stuff. And, and the things that we need to spend money on, it's like they're holding back or they're trying to cut it down. Trying to cut it down. Yeah, like all the different buses have like the schools, like when I drive and work in the morning here at West, like Anatole Rogers would have like two buses. All those Cleveland Indians, Carmichael, Parmi, all of them have different buses headed from West. And I feel as though they need to have police on some of those buses as well, because there's one, I know for a fact that government house still has one. But you wouldn't want that child on that bus. Wow. Yeah. So again, uh, there are some, um, I guess, good programs in place, but are they being managed properly? Are properly, they being yeah. Cost, right? And again, like I say, we again. sit down and talk a lot, but can we make a difference? So let's not just talk, let's get out there into our communities. Let's see where we can assist. Let's see where, you know, we can just even help to enforce. Okay. Because I truly believe all the parents, I, I I want I will make all the parents go to school right now and and from primary school I want us to be taught on how to raise children and conflict resolution. This, what you have to do is you have to look at your community and say what, what issues are we having? High divorce rate, um, broken homes, um, conflict resolution. So they need to be taught from primary school. Okay, so we need the, the, this age-old school system where just our backup curriculum, it, 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 25 years, 50 years, no change, some, something has to be done. Okay, so we need like-minded people, 
uh, educated persons to, to get into these positions and, and make a difference or volunteer to be on these boards, or even most of these boards are paid boards, find, find out how to get on these paid boards and, and you know, so your voice will be heard because you have a seat at the table. Okay, so 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 very good. Um, bring into light some of the issues in the communities. Now we need to find solutions and fix them. Okay, so so very good, Avery. Thank you for bringing up that topic. And we went completely south. So thank you, Avery, for sharing. Okay, um, Shamara. Hi, Miss Bullard. Um, Hi. to reiterate, because I think two other persons who already spoke about the meeting, I attended Toastmasters as well. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so yeah, I attended Toastmasters as, as well. I'm sure someone said the word of the day was titivate, which is to make something more attractive. Um, the table topics were good. They talked about your past, well, school days, how school days were. And then they also spoke about having quarterly articles and newsletters and visiting church to, to speak to people about public speaking. And I left my number and email as well because I would like to join it. I just want to be a part of one of them. And since it's on Zoom for now, and life is kind of busy with a toddler and school and work, I don't mind doing the online for now. But I still want to attend the event. So I plan to join. Okay, excellent. Because last, yeah. last, last year, I was like, I'm not interested. They're going to embarrass me. But now I actually want to learn public speaking because... I, I'm not really all familiar with it. So okay. I'd like to become a part of it so I could get used to public speaking. Okay, very good. And then again, it helps you just in your little huddles and your meetings that you have to have every day at work. And if you plan to be an executive, you know, they just pull you up. Uh, Shamara, chair a meeting for us in the morning, <laughs> you know? And, and yeah, you know, and then start. I'd be like, um, um, um. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes. practice now, so very good, yeah. very good. Okay. Um, Bria, you have your hand raised? Yes. Um, for a newspaper article that I read about AML acquiring uh, that east-west highway, that whole super center, and merging the Solomons and Cost, right? So they spoke about that. It's said to be a $17 million investment, and it'll create like even more efficiencies for them. So they, they will be eliminating that double rent cost by moving costs right out of the, what the place called, the town center mall and okay. create more jobs. And, moving uh, it to where? Where are they moving it to? They, they, they purchase in the whole, so you know where Solomon's is now by um, where the old Cape Bahamas was. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, they, they purchase in that whole um, super center. It, it was previously called Nassau Super Center. Uh -huh. They purchase in that whole thing and they move in cost right from down center mall and putting it next to super not super value, putting it next to Solomon's. So it'll be side by side. Okay. So by owning it, they would cut down rent costs. Um and I guess try to drive or control the market by having all of that in one place. I know Solomon's kind of well, not really wholesale, but definitely cost right is the wholesale. And Solomon's would be the retail for groceries and stuff like that. Yeah, so, so it'd be like a Walmart and a Costco. Yeah, so yeah, it'll just okay. be one big um, super center format. And yeah, that's pretty good for AML. And they said that it'll be completed by 2023, like at year end. Yeah, but I'm confused because that used to be AML's head office. And it, 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 I guess they didn't own the whole markets and They let it run down like that. Yeah, but I, I no on that. the side of Solomon's. No, they, on never Bay. they always rented that. Yeah, they uh, rent. Yeah, so oh, now they, okay. they, all it. Does, they move their uh corporate office to Thompson Boulevard, which they were renting out to social services. So that was a better fix whereby they don't have to pay that rent. And then, um, I don't know if you remember, they were supposed to purchase. The old city market building as well, but they're not blocked. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. okay. Okay, well, good. Yeah, because that's an eyesore. <laughs> so, it is, I, I, Solomon's an eyesore as well. Okay. So, yes. Yeah, they need to fix that up. I don't know if they're going to keep the liquidation center there, you know, like right behind 
the Philly cheese steak place. Mm-hmm. But so they that burned to the ground. Yeah. No, not 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 there. That's burned so, down. Burned down. The liquidation, oh, okay. like um, oh lord, not the not the liquors. Oh, I can't remember what they sell, but I guess they sell like things people don't pick up, shipping stuff. I oh, I think. Oh okay. You oh know, so right? yeah. Right. What, what what's gonna happen with the Cave of Bahamas building in the front? No, I I'm, what happened, I don't know what happened in the front. I still think Cape Bahamas on that. Yeah, I still don't think. So. Yeah, I'll just want the whole gas problem is fixed. Eh? Uh, well, they say. Okay, but they just come up in the news for that for a long time. You know, it's two buildings. There's one in the front, like closer to um, closer to Robinson Road, and then there's Road. one to uh, Soldier Road. Not Soldier Road. Right. You know what I mean? But they still in that big one, closer to the food store. But oh. the front. Is an occupied, but I know it's still less. Office. Yeah, oh, okay. so okay. that's what the future looks like for AML Foods and cost right. Okay, that's good. It'll be closer to me, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Um, um, Demetria. Hi, I just wanted to talk about the Toastmaster Legal Lights meeting that I attended on virtual. Okay. Um, it was the Toastmasters Legal Lights Club seven zero one eight one nine three, and their their topic was fools within, and they had some interesting sessions. They showed that it, it wasn't a boring thing. They was doing like trivia questions, and and one of their models is members empowered to develop leadership skills, and another one is integrity, respect service and excellence and it was it was interesting i never attended one before and they sang the national anthem they did things like that and they had a business session an educational session table topics and they evaluated the topics and their word of the day was prudent that's for it <laughs> okay and what was your takeaway like what did you what did they talk about our table topics. What was your takeaway from the table topics? Well, the table topic, they, they basically talked about their fundraisings and stuff like that. And how they how they wanna get more people in and things like that. <laughs> okay, so are you considering joining or you'll probably visit again? I'll probably visit again because I already a part on that all thing <laughs> so that'll be too much to, to deal oh. with me and my kids I already a part of another charitable organization so oh, okay. I'll probably visit again because it was interesting but to say commit I already committed to something and I'll be you know <laughs> okay yeah so like I said but probably drop in once a quarter because mm -hmm. yeah the key is to network to build your network to get your name out there yeah. right know the right people okay okay very good the asthma okay Yasmin, or maybe I was just up from the last time, no? Yeah, no, Um, I wanted to actually speak on the bus service okay. because I thought it was a good idea about okay. that bus service. Um, A lot of buses oh, are, a lot of, sorry, a lot of buses are broken down. And I think if we um give contracts to people, for pickup services like the government. I think that's gonna help with the commune of students where it's only students allowed on the bus. Um, where, um, and the police presence, of course, is a good idea, but I feel as if it will be safer for, for kids, especially taking, because, okay, I remember a couple of years ago, there was a fight. Some Taurus students walk all the way from Prince Charles to Robinson Road to fight some Arm Billy or, yeah, I think some Arm Billy students. And I think that could have been avoided. Why? Why you walk from all the way down there to a different place and you live in the East? Like, I think that that's going to... Oh, sorry, I'm trying to get my thoughts. I think that's going to divert, um, well, decrease a lot of violence in the 
school with the school kids. Um, and I think it's, I think having the, the like-minded students all together in one school will help focus or refocus a lot of students and keep them on a path to where, I mean, a, like on a better path in life. Am, am I making sense? In my head, it makes sense. sense. You're making sense, but yeah. I, I, well, my next question to you is, are you sharing this with your member of parliament? Are you, each member of parliament has monthly meetings or, or, or quarterly meetings. Are you sharing this information with them or giving them these ideas and, and following up to see if, you know, it's something that they're interested in implementing? Or are you just telling us? I, I was telling y'all, <laughs> but if, if, if you guys, if you want to bond together, because I am, I'm too afraid of public speaking, I feel as if they're going to laugh at me and throw stuff no, at me. No, no. I've watched too much TV. I understand. No, but then, but if you don't, if you don't want to stand up in the monthly meeting, request an audience, call your MP, request an audience and sit down and talk to them. That's how it starts. Okay. You, 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 I think you can I do think it one-on-one. -on -one. You don't have to say it in a, a group forum. But the whole point is if I'll, you have I'll, a good idea and it can help the community. And and listen, all you have to do is get it started in one community and then the other community will it, copy it. Right. You, you see what I mean? And there was a bus system um through the mall at Marathon. Um, I forget the name of the people. But y'all remember the mall? It was like four or five different buses that um, got it. And I don't know if they were, were directly for school, but they channeled through the mall at Marathon. Y'all remember that? Convenient City? That's City what it's called? Transit, called. right. Convenient City Transit. Hmm. Right, right. So um, if you say there's a lot of buses that are broken down, that means then you need a mechanic. Okay. Um, then there's a small business development center and um, um, you could apply, um, you know, for funding through them. But, you know, it just depends on is it something that you want to do privately or you are selling this to the government that, hey, I will provide a bus service to Kamaiko area for, for the children or mm -hmm. something, something to that effect. That, um, let me think about that a little bit. Yeah, more. yeah, think about I, it some I, more, but I don't only want you to think and talk about it. I want you to talk about it. Act. You want us to act. Action. Act, act. We talk a lot. We don't act enough. Okay? And we talk for yeah. three hours and we don't act enough. So I want you to be serious about it and and, and think of it. And, and and then, like I say, um, speak to your MP or, or get your people together and, and and then approach the government it said to provide this you know as a con on a contract basis or something to that effect okay yes ma'am yeah it's still, happening. it's still happening in the family islands because we still have um children in the north going all the way to school in the south and, and with a bus system okay so if it's working in the family islands it could definitely work here and somebody is providing that service for the government they still have those big yellow buses Okay, so probably look, look into one of the family islands and see how it works, see who has the contract and perhaps even speak to them to get some, um, you know, if they will share any information with you and then go from there. Okay? Geraldo? Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> I read two articles in the newspaper. I think the first one would have been about um, Central Bank when they're speaking about how um, there have there been a uh, financing drop as it relates to the construction loans. So the banks prefer more of a turnkey mortgage rather than construction, especially out um, COVID-19 and the inflation of construction materials. So the bank pushing more for persons to come see um, regular turnkey mortgage rather than construction mortgage. And the other article I read is where the prime minister, one of the um, speakers, visited the Bahama yesterday, reference to the, um, the Association of International Bankers and Trust Companies. 
and how he said that the Bahamas is open for business and they moving forward to the, to this digital asset, cryptocurrency and the carbon credits. And he also said that since the arrival of um, this what FTX, cryptocurrency exchange, so it really underscores how the Bahamas wasn't ready for it. But now that they have the, um, the laws in place now, uh, they basically ready for this particular, this industry. Now, one of the issues reference to like cryptocurrency, I've noticed that there's an increase in financial crime in that particular area. I recently had got reports of two Bahamians who actually trade in cryptocurrencies in the Bahamas with assistance of relatives in the US. And they reported that their wallet, their hot wallet was hacked. So they lost like almost up to like $30,000 in US money in cryptocurrency. So that's one of the issues that, that our regulators really need to focus on as it relates to cryptocurrencies and to educate a, a lot of places who trade in cryptocurrency, how they could be able to store their crypto um, assets. We know that we have a hot wallet and we have a cold wallet. You know, the hot wallet usually be online. You have access to it, but it also easily to be hacked. And then we have the cold wallet, which is something you could actually store on a flash drive and keep safe somewhere in your house or in your vehicle or wherever you could keep. But we just have to teach people more and educate people more reference to cryptocurrency. Because if we don't, we will start to see an increase and um, financial crimes as relates to cryptocurrency, especially if we get into this particular industry. Yeah, and then another thing. Hmm? I thought the industry is known, known for the amount of risk uh, associated yes. with it and how risky it is because you only have identification number. And um, I don't know the terms, but some people are with an exchange and some people are not with an exchange. And so if you are with an exchange the, and a regulated exchange, the regulated exchange is required to collect KYC. The unregulated um, exchange is not required to get um, KYC and therefore you have a number, one, two, three, four, I have a number, four, five, six, seven. And you, you could be not Right, yeah. and so that you assume in that risk. And so a lot of people, a lot of behemoths love to take certain risks, and a lot of people yeah, just want to educate themselves on it. But, but listen, Geraldo, they take in the risk because regulated means Uncle Sam gets his 30, 40 percent. Unregulated means he gets no Free. percent. Yeah. You, flip, you get all your money, but you take in a higher risk. And so therefore, like you say, um, cold wallet versus hot wallet. And I don't know if you know because the terminology may be different. The, I assume. The cold wallet means you would have regulated exchange and the uh, court wallet yeah. means unregulated. Eh? So centralized. The and, yeah. It's centralized and decentralized. Right. But it's your, yeah, at your word. own risk. Yeah, it's that's the word. Risk. So they risk themselves. They, 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 they put themselves at the risk of getting robbed, basically. Right. And it happens right. all the time. Even with the centralized stuff, how much people bank account, how much people debit cards get hack a day. Think about that. Okay, right, right around. It's easier, okay. it's easier for the cryptocurrency because, like you say, the identifiers are very like numbers. You, can, just a you number? could guess, you can make right. a guess and get into someone's wallet, right? Right, and so, Haraldo, was this in the centralized or the decentralized, meaning the regulated versus non regulated exchanges? Do you know? The, this is more like in the uncentralized, but okay, then there's nothing you could do because but, in the centralized one, I believe. The security is um, commission requires you to have an indemnity insurance. That indemnity insurance means that's like Visa and MasterCard insurance. If there's a fraud and they can prove that it was indeed a fraud, nobody was negligent, negligent, then they will pay you. But, but if, if you go but in the but, but majority, then you don't get no, you, you nothing you can do. Hmm? Majority, majority of the time you have insurance on credit cards, you have, but you don't have insurance when it comes to your debit. Because if you lose but your money, the debit is still under Visa debit. and MasterCard. Under but Visa and MasterCard, they cover you 100%. If they get cool, you could prove that it was a fraud and you was a negligent. And what that means yeah. is you went yeah, to the Philippines true. and you call your bank and you told your bank up on record that I'm in the Philippines, but somebody still hacked your card, then they pay you back in full. 
But if you're going to the Philippines and you didn't tell your bank you're going to the Philippines, then they possibly, they they don't have to pay you. So it, it just really depends. And so I am even surprised that the police takes the time to even investigate in the, which one is decentralized, the one that's not regulated, right? Um, Abria? Correct, yes. Yeah, yeah. so you, you, you're all taking time and this invest at your own risk and then, you know, money coming to for your salary from this investigation. Who pay you all to do that? Yeah. Geraldo? Who pay you all to go investigate these people for all? Because they, uh, they the don't government? have some of their money. Yeah, but I mean, if, if people if people accounts being hacked in the bank and the bank you reported to the bank and the bank said they'll conduct their investigation, some nine investigation take three, four, or five months, and these people never get their money back. Yeah, but the bank then again, I can tell you in their terms and conditions, they will tell you there are two markets: the decentralized and the centralized. One is regulated, one is not regulated. And I am surprised that banks even dealing with the unregulated market because at one point Central Bank had said, invest, we don't have the framework in place yet. This was in 2018 and 2019, invest at their own risk, which means if should there be a fraud, don't come to the Bahamas, government don't call the police and don't expect us to investigate because it's not on law in the books of the Bahamas. Now that happened after I think there was a guy in Canada who had $15 million or $15 billion worth of Canadian assets. And he had it up in the cloud or whatever, it was cryptocurrency, and he died and nobody had the code except him. And they all went to the Canadian government, I think this was in 2018, and the Canadian yeah, government that's... said that it's not on our books. You all invested with him at it at your own risk, and he died. So nobody in no the court, and nobody could get into the cloud for them to get their money back. They lost. Yeah, that same show on Netflix. I can't hear you. They have that same show on Netflix, and they don't trust trust no one. That's a real. That's a real true story. That's a true story. So yeah, okay. Well, interesting to see that it's good that you are at least entertaining the people in it. Again, I guess because it's a new industry, you at least need to make note of what has happened. So if, as you know, it's going to happen often, you will have a pattern or you'll be able to, you know, for training purposes, I guess. Yeah. And then another thing, we have this tropical storm for you. I think the U.S. just issued a tropical storm watch for the U.S. Um, Virgin Islands. Okay. And like Fiona is at 60 miles per hour and still out there, at the, out there in the sea and is expected to hit landfall in the southern part of the Bahamas by Sunday afternoon. But I thought hurricane started at 45 miles, no? What is a hurricane? 75 miles? 65, 70. 65, oh, okay. 70. Okay, okay. Well, I, thought, well, I don't know why I thought it was 45. Yeah, so you all be very careful because um, a couple of years ago we had a tropical storm and it was I don't with the most rain, I, everywhere was flooded. So, so don't take it lightly. And if you live in an area with floods, please start to prepare because we've been having like 30 minutes of torrential rains with, with lightning and thunder. This is the best I ever see BC do in my entire life. But you know, it only going on for a couple of minutes. So you're, you're very, you'll be careful, please. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, Geraldo. Uh, let me. I wanted to take you back off of something you did say now. Okay, no, I remember when you was talking to Haralda about how you said there's a lot more risk in involving um dealing with the dealing with um the cryptocurrencies, this and that. And I just was piggybacking off and that off of that because we had a customer who was calling like they was calling profusely for a couple of weeks talking about how he won't open up this account for crypto cryptocurrency because I work I work at a I call my bank and he was saying now we can't deny him of opening this account because um central bank um say we have the framework or whatever whatever and and our MLRO told us well we spoke with compliance and they said we don't have the framework in place and she said oh it's very expensive for us to put it in place because it's so risky 
that we'll need literally like, I guess a whole different or subsection just to deal with that. So she was like, we ain't gonna do that no time soon. And so I wonder if like Central Bank is gonna put something in place where we have to do it because right now no. we- No, because we... many many banks, more, more than likely that'll be in the offshore world and many okay. banks have Lily. opted out of taking that risk. And right. so I'm surprised they, they like, call in a commercial us. bank. I was believing whilst was the believing framework, us. whilst the framework is in place in the Bahamas, a Commonwealth Bank does not offer that product or that service. Right. So therefore, right. you can't make your That's what he was trying to tell him. I think yeah. I don't know if Yasmin spoke to him, but I remember he came and he spoke. I mean, he called and he speak to like, he kept calling me and then he came in and he was like talking as if he was like denying him of service. Lenine, like, um, what I wanted to say not to cut you off, I think some of these customers misconstrue the information because like Ms. Bullitt said, it is in the offshore world. But I think Commonwealth Bank was having the issue where they, they were trying to um, decide whether they were going to onboard customers that physically work there. Um, um, to these, to these, oh, um, right. You mean work to the, to the... Right. Just how we do the gaming, they okay. had to decide... No, he said he wanted to open it up to no. do crypto we trading. Don't take, we don't onboard the business facility. That's what I was telling him. Right. But if you if you work there, it depended on the capacity that you worked in, just as like those who ha um, work for the gaming houses, whether we would 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 onboard your your deposit account or your loan facility. So that's I think um, some customers are not getting that portion, and they probably misconstrue what Central Bank would have told them when they call. That's also, what I'm understanding from it. Okay. Also, yeah. he might be pretty adamant about opening it there because he can't come to any offshore banks if he's a behemoth. That's what I was right. thinking. I thought, right. I thought he wanted to open it so that he could have like the coverage, like remember what y'all say, the insurance. So if he was to lose his money, the bank would help him recover it. I think that's what he was trying to get at because he so don't he want to go it. back and read since he won post central bank on y'all. Really, he he so bad. He talked about the and DARC and, and this he ain't even central bank. The DARC is the Securities Commission. Right, right. So he's like right. losing two regulators and misconstruing the information. Mixing it up. Right. Right, because y'all would have to get a whole license to be licensed. Y'all have to have two yeah. licenses under and the, the like central bank and the Securities Commission and right. all sorts of stuff. And okay. commercial banks don't even facilitate that type of business. I would have no. flagged his his number and every time he called i'd say i'll skip that one Early <laughs> and, and, and then he came in physically and so that's Come. how my manager security to, yes, please escort this man he can't understand english yeah i i think what he he probably wanted to get his cryptocurrency account too to probably make deposits into um yeah bank and i don't know i think scotia anybody from scotia i think scotia has some framework in where they do, they don't um, have a platform or anything, but you can tell the exchange to cash out some money to Scotia Bank and they'll accept it. I'm not certain. It's, but it's, I know Scotia, it's Scotia and Commonwealth Bank. You could um, send money from your wallet to them. Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, one time we couldn't receive it. But now, see people now. Saying, yeah, yeah, they're coming in. I, I see the FTF. Yeah, I see oh, coming okay. in. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So that means y'all can yeah. receive oh, it. Oh, how has it been done? Because huh? um, you I, pay pay you can receive it. Yeah, it's but they, how? I, I, they, people they, call they, and they ask, how can I do that? So they send it to whatever the exchange, exchange whatever will wire it. Have, yeah, exchange to the exchange. To their bank account, yeah. Right. right, and so, so that means that's only in the centralized in, yeah. area. So, so it can't it, come from a, a decentralized exchange. Area. Okay. No, they use, um, I think they call it fiat currency or something like that. Yeah. So yeah. it was this guy on um, Twitter. I don't know if y'all saw this thread. He literally did a whole video showing persons how to transfer like the, his cryptocurrency to his behemoth account, and it actually came. Of course, it had to get converted, but it came to his right. account. Right. A bank social that is accepted. I don't think RBC and uh, especially not BOP. None of them. Yes. Right. Because again, your, it, your institution has to decide if they're going to take on the risk associated. BOP just let with, them come through? 
um, no, it no, no, not on the way that it, it's sent. If it comes in um, through ACH, it's going to automatically hit. If it comes in through incoming wire, then that's where it stopped. And then um, um, management or shared services will yeah. contact the customer to get some additional information. But I've seen some come through um, and I would have had to contact the customer. If it's below the threshold, then whatever. Once it's um, within their level of activity. But I do. It depends on the way that the company sends it in. That's the only way it'll, it'll, it'll be stopped or it'll automatically go through. So they basically use corresponding banks to get it there. Right. right. Because so you can't send it true. straight from the, the wallet. It's so regulated exchange. Yeah. And that corresponding bank will be sending a wire, tra a regular wire transfer. Yeah. So that means all the risk, the risk now is gone because they that exchange would have KYC, that exchange would have verified. Um, and that exchange operates just like a bank. If it's outside of the profile amount, then they will ask for more information. They will ask to declare the source of funds and, and, and what have you. Okay, understood. Okay, so the risk now is, is, is much less than it being sent directly from the wallet to the bank, which I don't know if most banks even no, take. They don't, they you can't even do that. The, right, yeah, it goes to the exchange. Right. right tell them you okay. can't open no account. Then you can't open it right, because you all don't have that platform. They don't even have that type of account. So how we could even do that? Yeah. I mean, again, like like Gia said, he just misconstrued the information. Yes, the Bahamas does have the framework in, in place. However, this Commonwealth Bank does, Bank does not order, offer that product. <laughs> Please Simple stop calling that. this number. <laughs> That's out, outside of our risk. And even with like Royal Bank, like they say, Royal Bank and Bank of Bahamas say, we ain't even no. taking on the risk of accepting money from no exchange. We, we don't need anything else to make our bank high risk. Okay, right. and so our appetite- Even PayPal, they don't even accept PayPal. Okay, so there you go. Because all oh, of those yeah. things are considered high risk. They well, have third, I, yeah, third party I, intermediaries, and so they consider considered yeah. high risk. I think only CIBC and Scotia- Yeah, and pay the PayPal transfers, yeah. Yeah, so PayPal and um, was unbanked for many years. They just like the number business, just are being regularized, the number business and 215, I think PayPal just uh, fell under the regulator for the first time, probably in 2019. But they were unbanked prior to that, okay? Because they were not regulated. Okay, and so this is why it's important to, to keep up abreast, follow the um, um, FinTech Hub, so you will know of the various changes. And when you are approached, you could speak knowledgeably to it or understand why can we accept it, but we don't um, open the accounts for it. It's a, it's a product that we don't offer on our platform, no matter if it's regulated or not. Okay, so, so, so very good. And then of course, you know, it's regulated by the Securities Commission and we only have a, a banking license. We're only regulated by the central bank. So that means we'll have to go apply for a special type of license to even offer that service to our customers. Okay, outside of our appetite. Okay. okay, so very good. Okay, so a little bit that took us right into um, chapter five. Um, hopefully, you had the opportunity to read it. It's a continuation on um, with risk. Um, this question is on our classwork, so hopefully you'll be able to answer this question. It's a very common multiple choice question on the exam. Um, it starts off. It's in a rich based approach. The money laundering terrorist risk allows a company to be flexible when deciding where to concentrate their efforts. Um, the benefits are they allow management to differentiate between customers by matching the risk, high, medium, and low. And so whomever, which is normally your risk officer that mans the um, risk appetite of the business, they will say, well, listen, um, we have three high risk countries. We can't go to the fourth or fifth because again, we don't want the company, Commonwealth Bank to be overall high risk. So we're only gonna deal with these three high risk countries, Russia, um, Madagascar, and, and, and probably Venezuela. And so we can't, we don't want our appetite to exceed 20% of our business with high risk countries. And so um, we won't accept accounts for PEPs. Because again, 
with the high risk countries and the PEPs that will take us over the, let's say 50% threshold. And then you have um, money services, businesses, the cash and go approaching us as well as the number of houses approaching us. And so we see that there's a big um, need in the Bahamas because almost no banks want to accept the, um, the number of houses. Also no banks, out, the Canadian banks say definitely not to the money services businesses and to the um, gaming houses. So there's a market out there that needs to be serviced. Now Commonwealth Bank probably said we'll take one. I know Bank of the Bahamas said um, they'll take the number of businesses and I think they're taking the money services businesses as well. But um, deposit insurance is only is $50,000. That means should the bank de default and state banks are known to default, we are not gonna put our $550 million in the bank of the Bahamas, okay? So Commonwealth Bank may look at it and say, um, perhaps we'll get rid of the high risk countries and not ex you know, accept any questions from Russia or Afghanistan or any of those places. And we'll take on, we could perhaps take on two number houses or we could take on Western Union or cash and go. You know, it, it just depends, okay? Um, it allows senior management in certain circumstances to apply its own approach to the firm's procedures, systems, and controls. Again, your policies and procedures can be more strict than the regulator. It can't be less stringent than the, the regulator. And like I said, you find that in the offshore world versus the Canadian banks versus the Swiss banks, whereas the Canadian banks say, we don't ever want to be in problems with the regulator. And so the regulator asks for one form of ID. We are going to ask for two forms of ID. Okay. And so people will come into Royal Bank and say, well, um, the potential banks say we only need one ID to open up the account. And we had to say, well, Royal Bank's policy say you need right. two. Okay. So you can't be less stringent, you can be more stringent. Like this man is saying, well, I can tell you that the cryptocurrency is now regulated in the Bahamas and the employees are covered by say, well, we don't offer that products and service. We don't offer that, okay? So um, it helps with producing a more um, a cost-effective system because of course there are a lot of fines for breaches. Um, when you get these audit notes, uh, you have a certain amount of time to, to fix these issues. If you don't fix these issues, you get a fine. In fact, there's a whole administrative policy out there where it gives you dates um, of financial reports that have to be submitted to the regulator, AML reports that have to be submitted to the regulator. And should you miss those dates, you can be subject to a fine. In fact, with the finance department of every, anybody who works in finance, um, you will charge $250 a day for the, you know, I think there are quarterly reports, EMS reports that have to go into the central bank. You will charge $250 a day um, if those reports are not um, sent in on time. And so if a bank like Royal and Scotia Days laugh at the 250, but the smaller banks, you know, um, you know, they get on you, you get fired. Um, sometimes, you know, I listen to the finance people say, Oh, we normally, um, we just pay the regulator like $2,000 a, 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 a quarter because we never on time. And so, of course, when I was in audit, I had to stop that from happening. I said, you always pay them $2,000, crazy? No, 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 no. So I decreased all their limits in, in the finance department. And so the, those reports started to go in on time because we were not paying the regulator in fines every month, thinking that it was normal. Okay, um, ensure our attention and resources are focused where there are greater risks. And so of course, perhaps, or high risk, we can label that as high risk and we will increase monitoring. Um, we will label you as high risk and then we will get, you know, senior management or the board to approve. Okay, it's a, however, in situations where management fails to recognize or underestimates the risk, a culture may develop within the company that allows inadequate resources to be devoted to compliance. And again, 
um, compliance makes no money for the business. And so therefore, when the budget is being planned, compliance literally has to fight to house staffing systems and even availability of training, okay? Because all the money is, is in the, especially in the offshore world, is sent to sales so they can travel around the world and bring in these customers, okay? So we have to strike that balance between sales and compliance because there would be no need for compliance if there aren't sales people um, out there on the road bringing in the business, but you still do not want to underestimate the risk. And you also don't want to build that culture of we are going, we, we could do anything to get this business. And so we have to open up 10 accounts this month. And so we're going to manipulate the account opening forms in order just to meet our quota. Okay, because that happens a lot. Um, it says, from a supervisor's perspective, sample testing should be used or individual decisions reviewed as means to test the effectiveness of the in institution's overall risk management. So again, there's a lot of policy and procedure in place. Nobody ever has time to read it, right? And so um, I think I mentioned this with Royal by, you know, they came out with a, a whole online program and every every month they expected you for professional development to finish one of the courses. And so they allowed you, um, I think three hours a week. And so therefore, if you know, well, of course we all know that all the policies and procedures, all the laws were changed in 218 and nobody ever really paid attention to, to the laws. Everybody is be trained based on this how we used to do it. This is the best way to do this, or you know, we plug the system. A lot of us don't know our regulator. We don't know what the policies of the regulator state, and we definitely don't know what the internal policies of the company state for us to complete our function. So we want to ensure that time is allotted um, for all these updates that went into the policy. Hopefully they went in. And if your institution is still in the process which most institutions are always, or well, we still updating this for the last three years, then go directly to the regulator, look for those policies pertinent to your job description and, and, and make sure that you read them. And if you are the supervisor or the person checking, make sure that you once a month, call each person in your department and go through the functions with them or do a little test on what the policy states just to make sure that they understand. Because again, we as a team, we are only strong as the weakest thing. Okay. And so we have to get to the place where we don't just look at policy and procedure as, oh, that's a big tick book. We are overwhelmed. We don't have time to read that too. This is what's going to save my life because the hackers and scammers are really real. Like Haralo just told us. And and sometimes um you know, we get held accountable simply or we get fired for being negligent, okay? And we can't explain ourselves. We don't know what controls we put in place to protect it or what controls were in place to protect the, the institution, okay? The book then goes on to say, you know, no two companies are, are like, and last week we hacked on the metrics, the structure, you can't say Cornwall Bank, East Bay, and Cornwall Bank was fraud because two different um, types of customers, two two different size banks. You know, so every every branch has you know you all can have the same structure, but it has to be tailored to the number of customers you have versus the num number of staff. Okay, and then the types of customers that you have. So getting as much, you know, the marketing department normally have all this information for marketing purposes. Um, it really helps you. Even having the age, ages of, of um, the customer matters. Um, let me just give you an example of when online banking came, became very popular. I mean, of course, it was extremely popular on the retail side. And we were at um, wealth management to open an account with wealth management, it was $250,000. You had to have a network of 5 million, okay? And so automatically they said, oh, online banking was a blast. On the retail side, of course, 
every customer on the wealth management side is going to want it. And what they did is we used to have fax machines or customers drive it up into the bank. And they said, we're going to do away with, first on the retail side, passport printers. That was a very big problem for the elderly because they needed to see that money updated in that book. Then we're going to do away um, with statements. We're going to do away with the fax machines. And so you must send your, in your instruction by email. And we lost 50% of our customers because when we look at the average age of our customer, our youngest customer was 65. Because again, where did these persons get $250,000 to open an account with? It was their retirement money or money from their insurances and their investment because they had already worked for 40 years. Okay. Some of these, put in, this would have been back in, I would say, uh, 2010, 2011, they'd never used a computer. And so they said, well, I only know how to write a letter and send it by fax. And so when we realized and we started asking, why are you closing the account? They said, because we never used a computer before. I don't trust a computer. I'm, I am not going to use the ATM. I, you know. And so we would have risked losing all our customers for a simple, no longer using a fax machine, or we can't accept a handwritten letter that you drop off to the bank, okay? So that information about some, uh, what do you call it? Um, dynamics of your customer, their age, uh, where they work, where they live, all of that information can help you know your customer and, and make good decisions for them, okay? Um, back to recommendation one, and by now, we should know that with our eyes closed, countries must assess their risks, document their risks, and then put controls in place to mitigate that risk, okay? Very common um, uh, risk is um, the risk of fraud. And so most institutions have two persons to, to sign, so they mitigate that risk of fraud, okay? Just like the country should document their risk and put controls in, in place, then the organization has to um, do a risk assessment, document their risk, put controls in place to accept, you know, mitigate that risk, okay? That's recommendation one. And so, of course, we know the risk framework, again, it's threefold, the risk appetite, the risk assessment, and then, the risk rating of the country, of the company, and then of the client. Okay, and last week, um, somebody asked me about um, risk matrix. And again, most of these words are used interchangeably. And so what I showed you was a, a control library that, um, is normally used, but I want to show you um, not that wrong thing. I want to show you where is it? Right, yeah. So last week we showed um, the what some institutions consider a race risk met. Um, metrics where um, or they would consider this the uh, control library where they document each function and then they you know put the function in and they say how often do we check you know to review to make sure the um, staff are doing what they are supposed to do why are we checking to mitigate the reputational risk what is the inherent risk accounts can be open without approval okay can you all see the screen Yes. yes. Um, okay. Yeah. And in some um, organizations, they use this as a risk matrix. Also, in some organizations, they use what's on the screen now as a risk ma matrix. In my organization, we call this the risk assessment. Okay. And we document the risk category. And this is where we, the categories are like credit risk, market risk operational risks, and so on. 
Then we document the actual risk, the description of the concern, the likelihood, the impact, and then the gross risk. And again, we just weigh it out to be high, medium, or low. And of course, if most of your processes are high, then of course, overall, uh, the regulator will determine that your business then is high risk. Okay, so even though we have low and medium in most in the most of the categories, because now we do not want to do enhanced due diligence on our entire business, and we don't want to be subjected to audits every year and monitoring every year, we do have to give um, reasoning on how we came to the likelihood, the impact, and the gross risk being medium or low versus high. Okay, so this is the matrix or as well, or the assessment that we would send to the regulator um, that is mandatory under recommendation one. So recommendation one, I think FDRA um, section five, making it mandatory that each country and then each organization documents everything in their risk matrix or their risk assessment, okay? And so, um, in this instance, um, and this is just two pages that I took out of it. Um, they talk about operational and technology risk on fraud. And then uh, as you can see, we have our first line of defense, second line of defense, third line of defense. What happens, um, who has oversight, the board, there's a directive in place, um, um, IT system, there's a FOIA, I check and then the training system and, and various different information, okay? And so this document um, had over, what should I say? Um, we had, I think 55 functions documented on this on exactly what we do, how we protect um, the organization and um, mitigation measures and controls that we have in place. And again, we match that to what Central Bank requires. And on our um, security side, we match it to with the Securities Commission requires because we are duly regulated. Okay, so it's double work. So we had to do it for both the Central Bank as well as the Securities Commission. Okay, so, you know, like I say, people use either one. Um, we call this our risk assessment. Some people call it the risk matrix. We call this our enterprise-wide framework. And there were two that were um, due to the regulator. Um, the AML framework, the AML risk assessment was due with the framework, which means that everything related to compliance is, was due, I think, in June 2019. And the enterprise wide um, one, which is this framework, was due in October of the same year. So the AML only, only had AML and compliance functions. The enterprise wide means the entire organization, the compliance department, HR, operations, um, what else is there? Finance, credit. And what we found in that year was that the credit department said with Ms. Bullitt, I don't know the risk associated with, with credit. And I was like, but I am not a credit officer, so I don't know either, you know? And so we had a lot of pushback from our executives. We actually had to demote some people and put other persons in position. And we told them, listen, we are going to tie this to your bonus and we are going to put it on your job description. So please don't take on this position if you're not able to document risk associated with credit, risk associated with finance, risk associated with HR, okay? Because they felt, oh, that's a compliance job or that's risk job. No, they are the experts in that area. And so we worked along with them too, you know, because it was something new. It was never mandatory before. But like I said, the Bahamas has updated its laws and now it became mandatory. And like I said, this is very complex. But again, if you are the head of credit, this is what is now required. So everybody's job function changed 
a little bit, okay? Any questions so far? Have we ever seen the risk, risk assessments? Are we a part of it within our team or we just expect or the manager to do it? Yeah. Well, you just send me that though, because I, I never seen them before. Yeah, I, I, I can't send you the people's stuff that I, 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 mean, I should have. Nice. Not really. To give you all of this. Why you want so me to go to jail? In some police in this class? I mean, but look, because I've never seen it before. It's the first time I've heard of it like yeah. that. So Okay, so the FATF, go to the FATF site, and they have risk assessment. And at the back of their, um, let me see. At the back of their uh, thing on risk assessment, it um, it has a copy. So let, let me let, let me see. Y'all keep talking. I gotta see if I can pull that up. Yeah. Any questions? Give me some questions. You all just very quiet. Um, well, after the last class, when you was talking about how your company should have the lines and defense, the different tiers, I think. I don't yes. know if I said it right, but I did go and look for ours and we do have it. I didn't, I didn't know we had it, but okay, we do yeah. have it. Like yeah, so it's, it's three lines defense. of defense. Yes, mom. And the okay. Thing. But then you have to understand, just let's look, let's, let's, let's look back at my screen. Um, in your assessment, there's a lot of times, like I say, we, we talk about things like a, a common thing we talk about is enhanced due diligence. You ask what, two, two, three people, so two or the three people can explain what enhanced due diligence is, right? And so we don't want to just go around saying these words that we don't know. So here it is. You, yeah, your staff need to, to know in the event of fraud, the first line of defense, the second line of defense, the third line of defense, what do they do? So the front office receives regular training and Remind us on callbacks to the clients. This is consistently implemented because, we, of course, we receive all our transfer requests over email. And so we call those customers back because we have had how my email is T-Bullet 1-800. We have had persons just put a zero in that email and people didn't pick it up. Okay. And it was a fraud. So that's what the first line of the fence does. The second line of defense, compliance does not have any direct oversight over the callback or procedure. And then the third line of defense, callbacks have been specified, focus of internal audit for the past inspections. He does a th thorough check as he's a guy over a large sample of instructions with no adverse results. Okay, and then we say when our next um, um, audit is. We talk about the directive. External internal client transfer directives covers the callback procedures. Operating errors and losses, frauds, forgeries, and litigation directive also in place. Um, IT system, there's a four I check in place in the G2 system. So in our system, the person who enters this um, transaction has to then pass it on to a verification department before it's processed. And then that's the second set of eyes. Okay, so if your department is the first line of defense, in terms of what do they do? What does it mean? Okay, so you want them to understand what their function is. Are they the checkers? Are they the preparers? Okay, so that, that's, that's important to understand. Okay. Okay, good. Well, I work for corporate services, so I would say for me, because I work in a lot of law firms, it's quite different because it's like, what, three of us? Three of us in compliance. Well, I'm a data entry, but they have me in compliance. So I'm like the front, as I'm the front line, the first one, front line is the first line of defense, that's me. And then my, the person I'm under, well, who's above me, he's the second line of the executive. She's the MLRO, so we carry everything to her. But it, but the corporate services is just, it's just simple. I mean, I don't know what happens in the trust companies and the commercial banks because I've never gotten in that field in the commercial banks. So I only could go based off my experience and what I've known since I've been with um, McKinney. 
Right. So y'all don't have cash. So that's what makes it so much easier that y'all don't deal with cash. And then y'all are like third party because your customers will have an account at a bank that would verify them already. So you already okay, the whole care yeah, taste good too. Sorry. I didn't hear you. No, okay, yeah. So you're leveraging off the information that the bank really already check and verify it for you. So you don't have as much to do. Okay. Okay, yeah. So look at the FATF site and under their risk assessments, they have a, a chart at the back that you could perhaps look at. But I just wanted to give you all a visual so you always, you know, have an idea of how it works and looks. And again, it's it's tailored to each um organization now in the next class because um you know that's chapter five just talks about due diligence and we we just we covered that extensively in in intro and so we we'll just have a refresher i actually have a risk assessment that came from the um regulator and we are going to go through it and um you know try and answer some of the questions so um, we'll see exactly how our organization would be, you know, risk rated high, medium, or low. Okay. Um, any other questions? No questions. Oh. I enjoyed this class. Okay, good. I, good, good. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> okay. So, in um, it says in summary, a risk based approach includes the following areas. Um, risk identification and assessment. Do you want to assume the risk? Do you want to accept the risk? Or are you going to avoid the risk? Okay, risk mitigation. Again, we said that was insurance. Um, risk monitoring. The risk owner, whoever the risk manager is, or if there's no risk manager, then it falls on compliance. Um, monitors and measures the effectiveness. Um, of all the systems in, in place, does it make sense? Does it truly help us mitigate the risk? Um, is it effective? And then um, documentation, and it, again, policies, procedures, and job descriptions for, versus um, best practice, okay? Um, the book goes on to talk about, um, from a judicial perspective, the following are considered potentially high risk, cross-border, um, Corresponding banking and mostly in the offshore world, there's a problem of nesting where offshore banks, because of their appetite for cryptocurrency, because of their appetite for high risk jurisdictions like Venezuela, corresponding banks do not do business with them. Okay. And because the corresponding bank itself did not want to be high risk in its, its country. They, they do not offer that wiring service to them. And so in the offshore world, nobody walks into the bank. And if you don't have a corresponding banking relationship, it, it doesn't make sense. So they've just approached another Bahamian bank and say, send our wires on, on our behalf. And again, that's against the law and that's nesting. So you want to be very careful um, if you work in the wiring department that the institution is not involved in nesting. And, and they should be training you on this because like everybody else in terms of AML, having one annual training, if you work in the wiring the department, you are supposed to have two trainings. Well, every six months you are supposed to have a training and the staff has to sign up for, for, on that, okay? Um, trust in corporate service. Of course, you all know the, the majority of Ms. Bullitt's banking career was spent at Royal Bank Wealth Management and a very, our largest customer, owned um, art in different parts of Europe. And so mm. what they did is, oh. sorry? Somebody said something? No, sorry. No, no, okay. Yeah, so I don't tell you all this story. Hey, hey. No, no, no. <laughs> no. I, okay. I was a few. Right, so um, yeah, I just customer. Um, used to sell art um, and we exchange, you know, we would get a transfer to sell art, we get another transfer to pick up a piece of art. Shalisa, you want to ask a question? 
Well, not to cut you off, but I, I know we're talking about the training aspect of everything. I think the FY, the FIU is having a training, I think this month, I think this one between this month and next month, it'll be my first training. So I am not too familiar with the thought, the AML and, and um, terrorist financing trainer, the FIU has, I guess, annually. Okay. Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of companies, they um, opt to guess, go to the um, FIU training. Yeah. They just pay for their staff to go, but you have already done intro. So you should be fine. It ain't nothing hard that, you know, would be unfamiliar to you. And they switch it each year on, on various topics. So you should be fine. Yeah. So back to the trust and corporate services. So we were Royal Bank Trust. And I don't know if any of you work in trust, but um, trust is a corporate entity or a legal entity, which means um, when persons open up trust accounts with your company, they turn over all their assets to the company. And so it no longer is Gator's assets, but now the Royal Bank of Canada's assets. And then Gator writes a letter of wishes and say that, I wish that you send this money to pay school fees. I wish that you send this um, money to purchase this piece of art. And so they had over 800 pieces of art and they had these big binders that nobody ever opened and nobody ever looked at. And apparently this is why Royal Bank of Trust closed down completely because of reputational risk. Apparently they'd sent in a transfer and they said, we wish that you go and rent us a storage facility and we went into France. We um, looked around just for a store at all that could hold all these paintings. And they were transferring from Germany to France 100 paintings. So we found a facility to, that could hold all those paintings. And of course, the storage facility's name was in Royal Bank of Canada. And they, the French government sent a subpoena to us and saying that they wanted to um, they had a warrant to search the um, storage facility for stolen art. So we said, well, of course, go right ahead. And oof, when they went in, the stolen art was right in there. And so we opened the binders. We said, couldn't be because we have all these binders, but all the art and the pieces that they said were stolen for many years and they were looking for was right in that binder. And so, um, yeah, we, 33 persons went home, um, we shut down. Um, we had to go back and forth to court in France. Um, we were also charged with colluding with them to tax evade, but we was able to win that case, but the case is still ongoing. But because there are five entities of Royal Bank in the Bahamas and we were constantly in the news, the trust company that was very profitable, shut down and 33 persons went home. And at the end now, thank God that was before 218 because some of those staff members would have been going to jail. Not as well it do, some other ones. Okay, so you gotta be very careful when you work in these industries, um, especially um, or sure that you understand the type of um, products and services that you offer. And definitely if, Indeed, your organization offers cryptocurrency. Please, so, yes. What's the terminology you use? You said they were doing some. I can't remember the who, term. who was doing the the client. Oh God. Anyway, I, I hopefully you bring it up again. In terms of which story? The story I tell you now. Yes. They said we, the bank was colluding with them to evade the French government. No, not, oh man. Anyway, hopefully you bring it back up again. All right. I, okay, yeah. So, you know, what, I, what I'm saying is you want to understand the products and the services that your institution offers and the risks associated with it. Okay? And you want to have a policy on it, not only internally, but from your regulator. Like, like, like you say, Gia, you're accepting cryptocurrency payments. You, you, you need to know that which exchanges are regulated, which are not regulated. So once and you should be receiving money from versus what you shouldn't be. You know, 
And how do you tell if an exchange is regulated so that they can't say when you accepted and you approved that the money could um, hit the account and it came from a unregulated, um, you know, exchange. Okay, so you want to be careful about that. And then online um, banking again, e money, wire transfers, uh, you want to know all of the risk associated. Um, then it goes on to talk about delivery risk again in the offshore world, nobody walks into the bank. We have external asset managers sitting in Germany and Latin America and Spain, um, all over the world. They act on our behalf. We have to send them. These are the Bahamian laws that you must abide by when you open it up an account. And um, we have to ensure that they are trained also because they are acting on our behalf. Um, assessing customer risks, you want to ensure that your yeah, forms are not manipulated so that the salesperson could just have low risk customers instead of high risk. Okay. And then you want to look at the various um, country risks. You know, um, even though Venezuela is heavily sanctioned by um, America and Canada, we still have a big Venezuelan book. And so you want to ensure that you keep abreast of what's happening or there's somebody that speaks Spanish and then and, and pain. I think you could listen to the Trinidadian news to find out what's happening in, in, in Venezuela. Um, you want to look, you know, be careful of major drug producing transit countries, which the ICA book has listed as the Bahamas. Okay. You want to look at, um, be aware of the bribery and corruption activities. You want to look at whether it's politically stable or unstable, um, like Brazil and the civil law countries where Brazil is, um, you are guilty until proven innocent. So if you are accused of something, you go straight to jail and then you are then you have to work your way out, okay? And so we have had the governor of Brazil going to jail. We have had presidents in impeach, uh, being impeached in, in Brazil, a lot of account, or account officers going um, to jail. Um, it goes on to say that the risk assessment is only as good as today is done. And that's true because today, Ms. Bullock could be Lord Biden. And I say, I got to feed my jury in a pandemic and I go commit a crime. But of course, for administrative purposes, in that same risk assessment, you have the various functions um, risk rated at high, medium, or low. And so if they're high, you review them annually, not that you have to make any changes, but if there are changes, then you make them. Or if there are, there's an event where that's to put your bank on increased controls, then you update it. Other than that, you leave it until the expiry date. And then the book goes on to talk about the different types of risks and I just explained reputational risks why RBC trust flows because we didn't wanna ruin the reputation of um, Dominion Securities and capital markets in the retail side. So we closed. Um, regular, regulatory risks where you could get fines, withdrawals and removal of a person. We had a um, institution where, um, Central bank calls you in and, and they ask you, they, they call it moral suasion. They invite you to tea and they say, listen, sell all your shares and leave the country. But we have the Securities Commission that puts out notices and warnings and puts it all over the news and say, you have 90 days, nobody must do business with you. In terms of the pineapple group, you all remember the pineapple group that was blocking up East Street? Or was it East Street yep. South or across from um, Pineapple Express? Yeah, from Pineapple Express. Express. Right. So those notices. She in Canada know very well. Of okay. Living right. our best right. life. Yeah. So under the Securities Commission, they had it all over the news. They had it all over the website. Do not do business. They are not licensed. Okay. Like I said, Central Bank is a little bit more um, diplomatic. They call you in, they invite you for tea. And they asked you to move to leave the country. And they did this to a um, CEO out of Mexico, a chairman out of Mexico uh, last year. And he said, you all can't tell him to leave no country and sell his shares. So he took Central Bank to the Supreme Court. And so then the Supreme Court removed him. And it was all over the news. You know, they tried to do it um, diplomatically. But you know, he didn't agree. 
And then it talks about concentration risk. And I, I told you all about, um, yeah, one of our biggest accounts was out of Antigua and Barbuda, but they had all of their money, the government of Antigua and Barbuda had all of their money in this one bank, the same bank where they told the chairman leave the country. And um, Central Bank said that is too concentrate. We just removed the uh, chair money at the sell all the shares. And should this bank fail, this bank in Antigua and Barbuda will fail. So take some of the money and put it in Scotia or put it in Royal. And luckily they did because that bank would fail and shut down. Okay. So are there any questions? Do we have a clear view on what the risk assessment is and what has to be? We looked at the country level at the Basel Committee. We saw their methodology. We see how they determine whether a country is high, medium, or low. Then we just looked at the company level where we determine um, whether um, or not the business itself is high, medium, or low. And then next week, we are going to look at what the regulator stands to determine along with the risk assessment. And then we'll close off in chapter seven, the last chapter on this, where we will look at risk ratings and how we risk rate a client. Ms. Bullard, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. Okay. This all this talk about crypto have me really, I'm attending a AML and anti-financial crime conference in October in Las Vegas. And they have a workshop on cryptocurrency and all of that. I think I'm going to try and apply to attend the, the workshop on crypto because you'll have me really intrigued now to learn about the crypto. Okay, but good, very good. And I hope we still have some classes so you could you could share it with us. So yeah, please go. There's there's no yeah, the information out there. The week of the the week of October 9th. So we'll have another class or two afterwards so I could share what I learned in the conference. Okay, excellent, excellent. Excellent. Okay. So again, like I say, if there are new products and services. Um, please learn about the sand dollar um, and please learn about um, all these digital currencies because this, this is the new way of the world. And so don't, don't get left behind. And so when your organization comes and, and approaches you, um, it's just a matter of time before, you know, everybody, we don't use cash at, at all because um, cash causes us to be cash intensive and, and possibly a little bit high risk and we need to do everything possible not to be high risk. So don't be surprised if, you know, um, these exchanges will become regulated more of them and more popular. And um, yeah, just, just be familiar, have the awareness and, and know about the risk associated with it. Okay, and like Geraldo, he put in the chat, um, on Netflix, trust no one, the hunt for cryptocurrency. And that is the story of the guy out of Canada who died with the code and everybody um, would have lost their money. Yeah, did they um, say in the movie, if anything ever came out of it? Because now in Canada, it is regulated. So was the government able to, to help them or by the time they get to that, the hackers in Canada still don't run off of it? And I haven't heard I haven't heard anything reference to the government do anything about it, but I still believe the the guy who they alleged that he died some I think he they say he died in India. I I to, to the point I feel like he 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 some he ran off with them people's money. There. Yeah, he's somewhere out there because he <laughs> is the only one who has the key, and his wife don't have the key. But I think I think they was looking into his wife as well. Yeah. Okay. I could put that. I I gotta watch that because I was very intrigued by that story. You know, I say, "Oh, them poor people." But the government said, and even our government back then, before it was regulated, um, they they said, you know, invest at your own risk because if something happens, we will not um assist you. And so many things were happening, and now it's in place. But it's very ironic because cryptocurrency was created. In I think the early 90s by a 21 year old guy who made it so that it couldn't be, the whole point of it was not for it to be regulated because that means Uncle Sam gets a 30 or 40%. Okay, so the whole purpose of it was for it not to be regulated. 
and then countries around the world talking about they're regulated. So it's, it's crazy. And I guess that's why they have the decentralized versus the centralized. You know, they're trying to find a way to regulate um, these uh, products because Uncle Sam needed his cut, but also it does hopefully, you know, defray some of the risks. Hopefully. Yeah. Miss Bullock. Again, are you? Price on cryptocurrency being dropping recently, about three, four months ago, it was like $60,000. Now it's like $19,000 right now. But yesterday yeah. it was like around 21000 Yeah, it has been fluctuating. You also saw the guy from Shark Tank. He, he lost, what, a million dollars in one day? I'm messing with that. Yeah, in one day. I mean, it, 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 you have to understand it. The key is you have to understand it. The market itself is very complex. You, If you are prepared to watch that every day, um, um, read prospectus, um, stay abreast of the news, there's no use you invest. Other than that, you pay somebody, and once you pay somebody, they charge you 50% of whatever you make. So, yeah. And then 40% go to the government. <laughs> so you might end up with 10%, but, but it, it, it's still people are, that's the only way to make money because you don't get any interest rates anymore. Okay. Ms. Bullard, could you yeah. go over um, essay question number two, please? Essay question number two, let me see. I'm having difficulty. Or, or did you, or did you same, math, same, same. Thank you, math, Bria. Thank you. The homework. <laughs> <Ready>? Yes, please. That's <laughs> question number two. Your company operates in several jurisdictions, Iran, Somalia, Liberia, Russia, and Nigeria. As a part of the training program, you are asked to prepare a document setting out what should be included in a robust sanction program, highlighting the penalty for breaches. So if you go online, go see if they high risk or low risk or medium risk countries. Now, Russia is medium high. Iran definitely is high. Somalia, I think is high and Nigeria is high. Okay, so enhanced due diligence. Um, and then what, what page, and I, somebody emailed me about this and I tell them this already. So who's still confused? On I page 29? I, I confused, I didn't email you. Okay. Somebody emailed me. I did a question, I was lost myself. Okay, so enhanced due diligence if the country is high risk, correct? Correct? Yes, correct. Okay. Yes. And then the robust sanction program is on page 29 and 30. Design a compliance framework. Document policies and procedures, define roles, raise awareness, then assurance programs, um, escalation process, continuous integration of results, sanction screening list. What do you mean by prepare a document? Just if you would, you, okay, this is a training program. Prepare, pretend that you will present this to the class then. The office to use the MLRO and new training, the, the, the staff on sanctions, and the policy states that we should have documented policies and procedures. We should look at the OFAC training list. And, 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 and then perhaps you'll say, you could find it at this site or, or, or what have you. So do, do it like a do it like a slideshow. Yeah, you do it in essay form, but I mean just pretend that you will it's a training. So you could have some bullet points in there and uh, well, the format isn't really important. The fact that you talk about enhanced due diligence and what you do for enhanced due diligence and and um document the program and, and then the penalty for breaches. And they, are, they tell you the various banks was charged, this or that for sanctioned breaches on page 29. You, you were able to mark the, the first questions. So the, I, the I first said question. that at the beginning of the class, I, they come in out this, this evening. You should get them between this evening and in the morning. So OFAC imposes aggressive financial penalties for breaches. In 2009, Lloyd's 1.6. 
75 million pounds, Barclays, National Bank, BNP, everything right there. Don't get caught up on, on, on the format, you know? You get uh, the points for enhanced due diligence, the breaches, and uh, what should be in, in the sanctions program, and given an example, the UN, OFAC, different things like that. You can even talk about the categories. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Any any other questions or concern? No. Thank you. Okay. So if you have not been to intro or you've been to intro or the bio or you need a refresher, please read um chapter six and come with questions because we really won't spend a lot of time because we should know that by the back, like the back of our hands, um, chapter six. And so, like I say, most of the time we'll be spent going through um, a document that the regulator sent and we are, we'll be trying to answer the questions. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, guys, have a... Fabulous week, and, and we'll see you next week. Good night. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.